Hi, this is Sean Head again. I'm here with composer Gabe Lubell, and we're here to talk about his piece, Song of the Little Owl. So thank you for bringing me out to Canyon College with uh, Bonry, and we're going to you know, be playing your piece tonight. Um, but I want to talk to you about your piece, a little bit about yourself, how you got into music in the first place. So what's music to you? How did you get into this? <laughs> what's music to me? How did I get into this? Um, I don't know how to answer the first question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I... <laughs> Uh, how did I get into it? Um, you want like the long story or the short story? Uh, give us like the, that that first moment when, like, like maybe like the introduction of when you first realized that you could become you could become a musician yourself and you could have this career. Like, what made you want to do that? Um, well, it was a very gradual process. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'd always liked music and I'd always listened to a lot of music. Um, I was never, I always wanted to do music, you know, but was never, wasn't necessarily interested in being a professional performer or anything. I just liked making music with people. Um, and then at some point in college, uh, I remember one of my, one of my music professors talked about how he became a music professor because he liked talking about music. <laughs> and it suddenly dawned on me that like, wait a minute. You can do music, but you can also just be a person who talks about music, <laughs> right? Like someone who helps other people make music, and um, and I, that was really appealing to me. I, both of my parents are social workers, mm -hmm. uh, so I don't come from like a traditionally musical family, but I come from this a mm -hmm. uh, 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 family of people who who like to help people, like to educate. So um, so yeah, once I had that realization, I kind of thought about at some point, you know, becoming a, becoming some kind of, of, of music professor. It was a windy bit. Because mm -hmm. um, you've held lots of different college positions in this past, like, decade, right? Well, I've held position, I've held different positions, um, but I've also done different things. Because mm. um, immediately after college, I didn't go to music school. I went to astronomy school. Mm -hmm. um, and you got your master's, correct? Yeah, because um, I, 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 when I was in college, I'd been studying everything, um, and then applied to graduate schools in music and astronomy, but uh, Indiana took me for astronomy, which made me happy because they were doing research I liked, and I figured, well, there's this school of music down the road, so mm -hmm. I can surely get my fill of music while I'm doing science, and that mm -hmm. was appealing to me. Um, and, uh, but yeah, but then, you know, after doing astronomy full time for a couple of years, I decided that it was important to more fully be immersed in music. Mm -hmm. um, so then I went over and, and, you know, committed to that. Now, do, does the astronomy and the physics side of you have a relationship with music or are they separated? There is a deep relationship. Mm -hmm. There, Well, there are relationships on multiple levels. I think the deep relationship is that when you train as a scientist, and an astronomer in particular, you learn to view the world and view relationships between things in a certain way. Mm -hmm. There's a certain kind of language you use. Um, you, you, you detect connections between things. Um, and in particular, as a composer, what that, how that ends up being manifested is that if I see something in the world that I think is interesting, my inclination is to understand or figure out how it works and why it's interesting. Sometimes those are questions that can be answered on Wikipedia. Sometimes they're questions that are a little bit more challenging, if not unanswerable. Um, and that's where composition kind of is helpful because I, I, I think of a lot of my music as trying to work out a problem. Mm -hmm. um, so I take the notion of composition as research pretty seriously. I like to understand all the facts about a piece as, as, as well as I can before mm -hmm. composing. And then on some abstract level, the music is, is kind of helping me and ideally the performers in the audience also kind of get a little deeper into whatever the, the subject is. Um, so are you looking at it kind of like an experimental and a theoretical like physics perspective when you're writing a composition? Well, I would, I would view it less as an, ex I would think about it less as an experiment and more as an attempt at creating discourse, 
Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, because when you think about what science is actually trying to do, it's trying to answer questions, but not, I'm curious and I want to know something, oh, now I know it, I'm good with life and I can move on, mm -hmm. right? It's about taking part in this kind of communal human effort to better understand our place in the world, right? Mm -hmm. And that, that is a kind of discourse, right? It's a kind of, mm -hmm. a kind of communal progress and, or intellectual progress. And, um, you know, music being an expressive art form has the ability to further discourse in a way that science itself can't, mm. right? Um, and that to me is very, very compelling and powerful. Um, but the truth is that like this, these are things, you know, I'm kind of talking about it actively in this conversation, mm -hmm. but when I'm actually working, these are things that kind of operate in the background um, most of the time. Okay, so it's not the forefront of thought, it's just just the kind of the but the fun the the basis of the way that you're working yeah i mean i you know <laughs> the joke that i tell is that you don't go through doctoral coursework in astrophysics and come out the same as you were before <laughs> right you can't undo that <laughs> um and a lot of that stuff sank in very very deeply um so it it, it must necessarily inform the way that i work and mm -hmm. and operate now occasionally i do write science music um mm -hmm. i don't do it I don't do it super duper often, but it, but but when I but I I do every every now and then, and in those cases, uh, I feel an obligation to the science to make the music, mm -hmm. you know, really kind of embody the concept and 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 inform us about its poetry or mm -hmm. its you know, because it's you know if you if you are familiar with the science, then it's immediately obvious maybe what's poetic about it, but to everybody mm -hmm. else, that's sometimes a little harder to grasp. So it's obvious that lots of these science, like uh, le these different aspects or these different things that you are discovering, are inspiring your works outside of science. Are there are there things that do inspire you, like written poetry, oh, sure. other arts and stuff like that? Oh yeah, I mean I like beautiful things, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I like I like colors. I like I like the world. I mean I like people. I like all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, and and really it's it's. I guess it's not so much that I'm inspired by science, it's more that science has provided me with a framework for understanding all of this mm. kind of stuff, you know? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I wrote a piece about a sunset once because it was a beautiful sunset, not mm -hmm. because I was super, super keen on refraction, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah, I understand. <laughs> so, yeah. So, now, <laughs> instrumental-wise, you started on oboe. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. then you moved yeah. over to clarinet primarily. No, not or? not quite. I so I oboe was my first instrument. I started that when I was in third grade, mm -hmm. um, and then I bet your parents loved that. They were very happy. Really? Oh, yeah. Were you a good Were you a good oboe player right at the, at the onset? I mean, as good as any third grader is on the oboe. Because I when I, I uh, <laughs> when I taught in high school, I used to have to go to the middle school, and uh, I remember that I heard one of the oboe classes the beginner oboe classes mm -hmm. and it was very frightening i mean it's you know fortunately i was playing on my own so okay. i only it was only me um yeah i did a mean hot cross buns after my mm -hmm. first lesson um and i don't know i mean i i i, I liked playing music it was mm. my, and it was fun to learn how to read um i remember i got into the all-county band um, <laughs> and that was one of the best, I, I remember it vividly, it was one of the best experiences of my life, uh, you know, when I was very little. And I remember, I actually sat next to uh, my friend Susie Campriello, who, who was one of my oldest friends in the world, and she went to Kenyon. Um, mm. So it's kind of a neat little cosmic thing here that this is a person who I've known since forever went here, and now I get to be here. Kind mm. of get the whole Kenyan thing that I heard about. But yeah, but no, but I played oboe for a while and I, I enjoyed it. My teacher, my first teacher moved from New York to California um, and I kept with it a little while after that, but, but kind of faded out at some point until I got to high school and then people, so this, my friend Susie, who I mentioned, kind of spread the word that she had known me, that I was this oboist and uh, so I got kind of sucked into the band um, and played oboe in the high school band for a year, but then switched to bass clarinet. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was bass specifically. I've had actually very little experience on B-flat clarinet. 
Hmm. Um, so I played bass clarinet through high school, college. I had no instruments other than my mom's old alto recorder. So hmm. I played recorder a lot in college. And then over the course of grad school, I've accumulated many instruments. Hmm. So I and when did the composition aspect of your life start? That was also, that was in high school. Um, okay. And I should say, throughout all that we were talking about, I was just talking about instruments, I was singing this whole time too. Hmm. So I'm actually, you know, as a performer, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a singer primarily. Oh, okay. Um, now, is an uh, opera um, leader or theater? I, <laughs> I, I've done mostly um, small group chamber singing. Mm -hmm. um, I did a lot of early music while I was in grad school. Hmm. Because um, I really, I, I, I prefer doing one per part, blendy, okay. independent music. Um, so, yeah, so I, 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 was, I was in Indiana for about a decade, and mm -hmm. um, I did all kinds of early music gigs all over the place. So, oh, that's really cool. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, I, yeah so, I, so that's, that's mostly what I, do, what I did. I, I don't particularly like doing solo singing. I don't have a very big voice for opera. Mm -hmm. um, when I was in high school, I was in musicals, but you know, um, yeah, I just really like the idea of making chamber music with voices. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the composition, um, when I was in high school, I, so I'd been singing a lot, I'd been playing a lot, and I was really attracted to the idea of music theory mm -hmm. and the idea that like there was sense to be made of things. Mm. And I thought chords were really cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, so, and I didn't know anything about this stuff other than what I was kind of picking up as I went along, but towards the end of high school, I started to experiment with composition. I downloaded some free notation software just to plug stuff in. And I started by just plugging in music that I had been performing. I wanted to like hear how individual parts sounded or, you know, if we were doing an eight part thing in choir, hear what just two of the tenors sounded like or something. Mm. And then you know, it was kind of inevitable that I started making my own stuff. Um, and then once I got to college, uh, it, it, I kind of ballooned as a composer and mm. just wrote a lot of music, all kinds of stuff over the course of the four years. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, college was a period of tremendous kind of musical growth. I mm -hmm. learned a lot of stuff about how to make music, about music history, mm -hmm. obviously music theory. So, yeah. so let's move on to your piece then, uh, so, since we're talking about composition. So we're talking about your uh, Song of the Little Owls, mm -hmm. um, which was uh, generously paid for by the Omamuki Foundation. Mm -hmm. So we're very thankful to them. Yes. Uh, always thankful to the Grant uh, Foundations. Now, what, where does the title come from? So, uh, so I've been living here in Ohio mm -hmm. since the summer, so it's been less than a year. And... Um, Gambier, Ohio sits on the Cocosing River, which kind of runs through uh, where Knox County, it runs through this and the two adjacent counties and eventually makes its way to the Ohio River. Mm -hmm. um, and the Cocosing is not a major river, but for this area, it's a very important, uh, it's a very important feature of the landscape. It's influenced the culture, it's influenced um, the way of life here uh, and the pace of things. Um, and I, I've always kind of been attracted to bodies of water and the way water kind of works. So whenever I end up in a place, I kind of seek out the water. And I think this, I, I'm a native New Yorker, so I you know, grew up around water. And uh, when I moved to Indiana, all of a sudden had no water. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> So I think so. It's this has become a kind of important thing for me, mm -hmm. um, and um, you know when this commission came up and I said, oh well, there's this great little river and I see how important it is, so I decided to write a piece about the river and the owl connection is that Cocosing is a the 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 the, the, the name, um, it's a Native American name and mm -hmm. with old old origins, uh, but it roughly translates to uh, the little little owls. Um, so owls. In this one, in this, so this uh, river, as you wrote in the program notes, it runs into the Mississippi River as well. Well, the Ohio, yeah, the Ohio eventually makes its way to the Mississippi. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Now, why Shakuhachi and bassoon? Because <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> other, other than that's what, 
Well, well the, <laughs> I'm laughing because that's, that's what I was asked to do. But, okay. that's, but that's not true. I was asked to write a piece for Shakuhachi. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I, at the time that, that this came up, I, 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 I've written music for unaccompanied instruments, um, which is something that I really like doing. But at, the, at, the, at that moment, I didn't necessarily want to do a solo piece. I wanted some other thing to happen with it. Mm -hmm. um, and Banri Hoshi, who's playing this, uh, this, this, the premiere of this piece, uh, we, he and I have collaborated a lot. So I know his playing, I know what he sounds like. And, um, and I, I think I know the bassoon fairly well. And some, on some abstract, some level, I, I felt like this would work. Mm -hmm. um, Which it does. Very well. Yeah, that's the good news. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and I just, so I figured like, okay, this could be a thing. And you were game. Mm -hmm. So that was nice. Thank you. Yeah, I'm um, game for everything. Yeah. Really. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, and then and the, 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 the advantage really being that you have a high instrument, you have a low instrument, you have two instruments that are very colorful, mm -hmm. uh, but will, but, you know, I figured would still blend together. And, you know, it's a piece about a body of water. Mm -hmm. So... Um, the idea of having two kind of very independent parts that kind of support one another but are just kind of flowing on their own, I thought kind of nicely, nicely captures the notion of the river kind of just making its mm -hmm. way, following gravity's course, you know. Yeah, and you mentioned the other day that Shakuhachi and Bassoon both have, uh, it's easy to hear the overtones mm -hmm. in them, which helps match and actually make them blend a lot better together yeah 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 i mean it's it's they're, they're both acoustically rich instruments mm -hmm. right and acoustically rich in ways that are that are not super they're, they're like they have very different characters obviously but mm -hmm. they but the richness is a is a compatible richness right all of the, the both both instruments producing a lot of very high dense harmonics and mm -hmm. um and i think that helps the blend quite a bit mm -hmm. right the the it's i don't this is not the the right word but like there's a readiness to both instruments mm -hmm. you know i say it's not the right word because i feel weird telling a, a flute a flutist <laughs> that they sound reedy that's mm -hmm. it but <laughs> well i mean as you even said before some of the uh like the the characteristics of shakachi sometimes it can be brassy sometimes it can be mellow sometimes it can just be really windy sounding yeah. and, and what i'm as working with bonry through this piece i'm actually noticing that the bassoon can do the same thing oh, yeah. as well and it has a lot of those like it's very i wouldn't when as when i was studying composition the instrument when i thought of the most dynamically ranged instrument i thought clarinet mm -hmm. when i thought of an instrument that's extremely colorful and has uh, i think you know usually i think like flute bassoon um, violin or cello, violist. Like, so a lot of the strings have, uh, because they have multiple different strings that they can use, but the bassoon, because of how you can manipulate that, that bigger reed, allows for so many different color variations. Well, that and the bassoon itself by design is... Because it's open hole. As well, well, that and, and it's, I mean, it's got... Bassoonists work to even out the registers, right? But the, mm -hmm. but the, but the, but it has several distinct registers. Yes. Um, that, that each do have like, ra they, they can have radically different timbres and, 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 and feelings to them. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, I, I've written an inordinate amount of music for bassoon. Yeah, like, which I'm, includes a bassoon quartet. I wrote a, <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I've got this piece, I've got a bassoon quartet. I wrote a piece for bassoon and mezzo. I've got mm -hmm. a, Sonata for bassoon, bass clarinet, and piano. I've like bassoons are all over the place, mm -hmm. which is weird because I'm not a bassoonist. Uh, mm -hmm. It's like the one instrument I've never played. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I, I like some of the things. I want to compliment you on some of the things that are in the piece. Um, and the the sliding in the bassoon and the sliding with the shakuhachi really plays this colorful uh, the role. But also when the shakuhachi and the bassoon are in unison or are playing at the same time, that's a really wonderful color. So how did you come up with that or what made you think with it? Because you didn't have the instruments in front of you to experiment with this. Yeah. Was that just kind of like a Hail Mary or was it yeah. a... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, it was an educated guess. Um, I, you know, I, 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 like I said, I know the bassoon pretty well and, and I actually, I, I, I'm not an expert 
in the Shakuhachi, but I, I have listened to it. Like I've known, mm-hmm. I had known about it since before, before this collaboration mm-hmm. came about. So I had some sense of the sound of it and just kind of like, you know, intuitively thought like, you know, I bet if these two instruments work close together in range uh, and pitch, it, sh- it would be pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, it was, you know, it was a bit of a guess. Um, and but one of the really kind of wonderful surprises of this has been that it actually, not that it works, but that it works as well right. as it does. Man, when it uh, exceeds it, expectations. Yeah, yes. I mean, and, and, and it's, it's, yeah, it's just kind of fascinating how the instruments work together. So all, a lot of these moments of octaves and unisons, um, but also kind of taking into account the flexibility of, of the shakuhachi. So, so the, you know, both its timbral modulation capabilities, but also its flexibility and pitch. When you take those kind of variables uh, or, 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 or sources of variation, and you put them together with a good bassoonist who knows how to also modify vibrato and things, you get these just incredible, incredibly live sounds. Mm. I mean, so some of these moments where you're just holding pitches, but the colors are evolving in unpredictable ways gives it a lot of life and mm. um, a lot of excitement too. It's it's like a it's a type of energy that I'm not used to seeing in Western music. Yeah, I, I and I I, I think. I think in this particular case, I don't know that it comes from any particular kind of aesthetic agenda or anything. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it mostly just came honestly from thinking about the subject matter. And, you know, if you sit and you watch a river, especially like a, a smaller one, mm-hmm. it's like you figure like, well, whatever, it's not doing anything. But then you realize like, no, there's actually a lot of life happening. But it's just little things. So, you know, it's not like white water rafting. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. And it's not about, you know, like, it's not about like the the, the flow of the water. It's like, it's it's this interaction of motion of the water on the top, motion of the water underneath, right? I love that, that idea that there are like, there's all this dynamics happening right but within something very simple i think it's something that you actually lose with a lot of bigger rivers like the hudson is such a big river um and it's 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 for me almost a little hard to comprehend as a river uh whereas something like the kokosing is you can sit and watch it and and feel like you kind of understand it Mm -hmm. a little bit um i mean i love the hudson i grew up on the hudson Mm -hmm. right but but it's it's a it's a much more kind of overwhelming presence. Mm-hmm. Um, so these, so yeah, so these these unisons and, and octaves and things. I feel like it's it's a way of kind of getting into the life of the water a little bit, mm-hmm. much like we and, and and musically, right? It's us getting into the life of these sounds. Mm-hmm. I think that's a beautiful way to finish this off. Okay. Well, thank you so yeah. much for having me out and uh, bringing Bonry to here to, to Kenyon College. Sure so, thing. And we're happy to have you here. Yeah, and it's going to be a wonderful concert tonight. I'm really looking forward to it. So thank you so much for having Great. me. Well, it's, uh, uh, I will see you guys soon. I have more composers to interview. Um, and so, well, I guess got to get all these recordings and get these um, stuff on a CD and get, yeah. it, get that back to you as soon as possible. Work, work to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, lots of work to do. Good work. Stops. Yeah. All right, thank you guys so much for watching. And thank you.